So enough um, diversions. We'll get. We'll go onwards with the demo. First thing, um, if I switch to my overhead view here, where 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 do you decide what shape to make your candlestick? This book, if you haven't seen it before, is an excellent source for shapes. As the, as the name implies, Shapes for Wood Turners by David Weldon. And in here, once you get through the preamble, you see things like that. Pages with shapes, as the name implies. There's all sorts of different shapes, bottles and decanters, lidded containers. If we start at the back, we've got teapots, salt and pepper, drinking vessels, uh, pestles and mortars, miscellaneous, bud vases, vases, more vases, bowls and vases, more bowls and vases, more bowls and vases, and bowls. And where I put my little paper, bit of paper in there, is candlesticks. So if you're, if you're stuck for ideas for shapes, you can always use this. And I find these quite useful books as well. If somebody comes to me and wants me to make something for them um, and they don't know what they want, I'll show them these books and I'll say, well, which bits of these do you like? I don't necessarily give them what's in the book, um, but it's, it's a good way of at least getting that conversation started. Um, and, and if you can narrow the field down a little by saying which style do you like, then you're halfway there. Um, this is another good book. It's Classic Forms by Stuart E. Dias. Um, and again, it's a whole collection of shapes. So if we flip through this one, you can see here, this, this time you've got, not, got no squares, but it's just lots of shapes. Table legs and balusters, all sorts of spindles, stair rails, spindles. Um, and here we've got some candlesticks, um, which is obviously useful. So, an assortment there. Um, yeah, there's lots of other shapes in there. And um, some, some pictures as well, where some of these might have been taken from. So, yeah, another good reference book. But, um, yeah, I find it uh, a useful source. Um, as I say, it, I, might, I might not do exactly what's in there, but it, at least it gives me a, a start position, sort of, um, to, to go and... Um, sort of plan something out and you can take different elements for different pieces and combine them if you want so so it's just giving you ideas of what you can combine and what might work what might not so um but i think i, I quite like this one in the middle of that page so i'm going to do something similar to that might not be same in terms of proportion but yeah something along those lines um what i've got i'm just going to move these books out of the way what i've uh, got what was the title again there paul that one there was Classic Forms by Stuart E. Dias, D-Y-A-S. After Paul's demo, I'll ask him to hold up the... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll type him in the chat. And, yeah, that's probably the easiest way, isn't it? And then we can do a screen, screen grab if you want, or he'll sure. type it in for you. Sure, that works. Right, so if I come back over here a minute, um, I've got these discs which I cut um, earlier today. I had a couple of rectangular pieces. This is about an inch and a half thick um, and about a five inch round. So that's going to be my two bases. And I've marked them out and, and put a cross. Whenever I mark the circle, while the, while the um, compass is set, I, I mark the centre as well, so I've got a centre mark there already, so that makes it easier for me. And then I've got two spindles, a bit rough and ready, but um, those, those are what I'm going to do the, the upright bit with. So, um, first thing to do is figure out how I'm going to make something on the lathe. So, you go back over here. My camera stopped switching. What's going on? Oh, there it is. Right. So, first thing I need to do is figure out how I'm going to mount these on the lathe. You can see on the spindle already, I've got a screw chuck. That's got a spacer on there to shorten the screw. Um, little piece like this, half the screw's plenty. Um, if you look at that depth wise, 
it'll take me not quite halfway, so so that should be fine. Um, I'm going to have to drill a hole in the top to join the upright. So if I make that the top side, then it's not wood I'm going to lose. It just means I've got a hole that I can enlarge. So if I'm a drill. So this particular screw chuck um, works with an eight millimeter drill bit. And I've got my little bit of tape there so I can drill it to the right depth. Saves time. Start to come loose. I've reused that bit of tape several times because I keep moving it. But um, yeah, that should be right. Right, so the, the, I, I quite like the screw chuck with bowls, with, with a lot of faceplate work. It's a convenient way of mounting a blank on. Put my piece of wood on there and screw it on. And hopefully I'll get that all the way up against the, the spacer at the back, which it has. And I want it against that spacer because when I'm taking cuts on this, I don't want all the pressure of that cut, all the force being taken on the screw. What should happen is the screw's transferring the, the weight into the lathe. I'll just move that just a little, then you'll see the screw chuck slightly better. I want that back plate on the screw chuck to take all the force of the cut. So for that to happen, your blank needs to be screwed on fairly tightly. So um, that's where we are at the moment. Right, just moving my dust extraction hood out of the way and then we can get on with this. So first thing I'm going to do is just set the lathe, uh, set the tool rest across the blank and clamp that just below centre. So when I'm actually turning on centre, uh, put, the, put the tool on the rest, I'm turning on centre. So that's uh, just a little bit of an adjustment there. So that's me about there. So I can take one of two cuts to flatten the bottom, I can do a push cut from the edge from here, so I point the gauge inwards, point the bevel straight across the piece and push that all the way to the middle. That's one way. The other way is to roll the gauge over the other way so the flute's pointing at about 10 o'clock and I'll use the pull cut and draw that backwards and forwards across the surface of that piece of wood until it's flat. I'm going to put my visor on now so it might get a little bit boomy. I'll just adjust my microphone so I'll actually close it. Okay, hope that sounds all right. So, lathe start off slow. Even with a small piece of wood like that, what I would do is stand out of the way, start the lathe up, and then bring the speed up. A piece of wood that size, I can go easy 1,000, 1,200 RPM, something like that. So that's about 1,200 RPM and it's stable so I can stand in front of it. So now I can put the tool where I want and start to take the cut. Bit of a bounce on that outer surface because of the unevenness of the thickness. So I'm just trying to work that down so it's flat and I've got rid of the unevenness. And as I'm taking this cut, I'm looking at the edge across the face to see that I'm cutting it flat. So if it looks like I'm not, I can make adjustments as I go. And then once I've got there, I can pick up a ruler, put it on the rest, and just hold it against the wood, and I can see that just touching on the edge. And also there's a little bit of a bounce there. So that's telling me I've not quite flattened this blank. Take a little bit more off. Try it again. The, the, the blank looks flatter, but there still seems to be a little bit of a bounce. So I'm just going to stop and have a look at that, see what we've got. And yeah, there is an area there which is yet to be cut sort of 80% of the way round is done, but there's a little bit that isn't. So, the ruler was telling the truth, there is, there is more wood to come off. 
before I get a flat surface. So that should be pretty much there now. So that's running without bouncing now. So that's telling me that I've got rid of all the unevenness. And I'll just want to flatten out the outer edge. Just a little more. Flatten the edge of that piece of wood. If I do that one, you should be able to see both views. So that's, that's near enough to be in flat. Now I've got to figure out how am I going to hold this the other way around. So obvious answer there is you put it in a chuck. So I've got... Stop that a minute. I've got here, if I switch to the side camera now, I've got here a chuck with dovetail jaws, roughly two inches or just over two inches, um, comfortably fit in the centre of this disc. So I can use those to hold the base of the candlesticks in the recess. Um, and what I've done is I've opened those jaws to about quarter of an inch, five or six millimetres, and at that point, these jaws are basically describing a perfect circle. So at that point, if I make a recess or a spigot, it's going to give you maximum contact between the chuck and the piece of wood. So that's the size I'm going to aim for. So I set my dividers to that measurement there. Okay, so mark the measurement on the piece of wood. So, and to do that, left point on the rest, the right point just stays up in the air. I visually centre that across the blank, touch it against the wood, and if I got it right, which I have this time, the other point should line up with the groove. So there's my mark for the recess. So now just to hollow that out. So I'm going to stick with my spindle gauge. Do a couple of cuts into there. It doesn't need to be a terribly deep recess. Eighth of an inch would do it. So that should be enough wood cut. Um, and then to get that to the right side, flatness and also the dovetail, I've got this tool here. I made this years ago. It was a standard square scraper and I ground that at 70 degrees, which is the same angle as the dovetail on the set of jaws I just showed you. So I can put this tool on the rest, hold it horizontal, and cut my dovetail to the right angle on the edge and flatten it across the middle of the piece of wood. So that's the, the bottom part of this blank then. As long as that's, yeah, that's not too bad. I just want to round off the edge. So I'm just putting my tool rest across the edge and then I'm going to flatten the edge off. I'm going to switch to the other camera for this. And <coughs> here, I'm going to use the gauge low against the wood, so you can see the edge of the gauge here. And if I, if I, that's the base, so I don't want to spin to that edge out. So I'm going to do my cuts from that edge to the top. So if I do spin to the edge, it's up here on the corner that I'm going to turn away. So use, use, the, use the bevel again. So I'm holding the handle down, I'm putting the flute at sort of about 10 o'clock again against the wood and cut across the surface of the wood. So you see that is making a fuzzy edge on the other side. If it really mattered, what I could do is cut three quarters of the way like that and then come in from the other side and that way I'll get rid of that 
uh, fuzzy edge and keep both edges crisp, but it doesn't matter. That's that's not an edge I'm going to keep. I'll take a little bit more wood off. And just to get these two looking the same size, I set this set of calipers to the diameter I want this to be. And it isn't quite there yet, so I'm going to take a little bit more off. If I'm going to make a pair, then I'm going to try and make them the same size. So I'll just check that diameter. These are rounded on the tips, by the way. If you've got ones that aren't, don't put them against the wood when it's and the laser's on. But these are rounded so they'll run against the wood without grabbing it. Or they should do. But even with that rounded tip, they're still being a little bit grabby. So I'll just be a bit more gentle with them. Right, so we're over it now. So that's down to the diameter. And I can take that other edge away. And um, it's not splintered, although it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't really matter. Now, if I want to clean up this edge, if I stop the laser, all I've done is a fairly square on sizing cut, so there's a little bit of tear there. If I want to improve that surface, what I can do is take a shearing cut. So instead of holding the gouge handle at this sort of angle, let me just switch to the side camera here. Instead of having the gouge against the wood like this, what I can do is drop the handle very low, as low as this rest will allow me. And in order to get that position, I'm actually going to move the rest because this is a, quite a wide rest here. So I want to be able to get the handle very low like this. And I'm turning the bevel to the left because I'm going to cut to the left. So my edge against the wood is actually at a shearing angle. Switch back to this camera now. So I'm taking a very much a shearing slicing cut and you can see I'm getting much finer shavings off by doing that. And that finer cut should be reflected in a better finish. And the more I drop the handle and the, the finer I make this cut, the finer the shavings become. So I'll just drop the handle even further and the shavings are yet finer still. So that's to clean up the surface. Let's have a look. So that's much better. I'm only worried about the bottom half. The top half I'm going to turn away. So I'm really just worrying about the bottom half of it so that's okay um i'm not i'm probably i'm going to shape a lot of that anyway so I'll, I'll turn some of that away um but uh just in case it's worth knowing how to be able to get that clean cut there so i'm bringing my, my sanding hood in there and rearranging things slightly i'm going to sand the bottom of this uh because that's the last time i'll have access to it on the lathe. So I can start off at 120, maybe 150 um, or 180. I've got, let's put that on. Right, just turning on my extractor. I've dropped the speed down as well. I've gone from about 1200 down to about 900. So I knock about a third ish off. So eight nine hundred would be about right, and dropping the speed down is just to reduce heat. And I'm just going to sand the bottom face, and also stand in, inside that recess. And what I always say to people is, whatever the first grit you pick up. What you're trying to do with that is to get rid of all the tool marks, bumps and ridges, torn grain, any, any other flaws or features that 
um, you're trying to remove. So there's still a little bit there that shouldn't be. So I'm just going to sound out a little bit more. And if you can't get out the marks that you're trying to lose with the first grip, there's absolutely no point at all going finer. You want to go the other way. So if, I, if I'm at 1120 grit here and I can't get the results I want, then my amp will be going to find some 80 grit. See if I can do it with that. But um, I think I'm okay with this one. So I've gone down to 180 grit now. Yeah, I've got sand in this all the way all the way down to 16 grit. So nothing's going to get past those. Might not be much wood left at the end of it, but yeah, I, 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 I bought them with the intention of using them for carving and shaping wood rather than finishing it. Because if you put a 16 grit sanding disc on and it does take quite a bit of wood off. It's the, the, I bought them for my four and a half inch angle grinder, so they're four, sort of four and a half inch diameter discs. So um, they're great if you're doing some shaping and carving. So I'm going down through the grits. I've done 180, 240. I'm on to 320 now. And that's the 400. So that's it sanded. So I'm just going to brush any dust out from in that recess. Make sure the bottom of that's clear. And I can turn my extractor off now as well. So when I've sanded that, I can, I'm going to throw it down even more, and I'm going to use some aerosol sand in see you. This is cell, cellular, oh, it would be, yeah, there it is, it goes. Cellular sand in see put a couple of coats of that on, give that a minute to dry, and then I can cut that back. This is quite an open poured wood, it's, it's, um, Rubinia or pseudo acacia or you might call it black locust, but it's it's all those three. It's the same thing. Uh, that bottom's dry now, so I've got some nylon abrasive pads. Um, the red is about 400 grit equivalent, 400 to 600, and then the white is 800 to 1,000 roughly. So just cutting, just for cutting back the sand in cedar. And then I can put a bit of wax on there. And then I can put that to a finish. Oh, look at that thing pop. Yeah, it's always, um, always a way you put the the sealer and the wax on there and it starts to bring out the colour in the wood. Beautiful. It's got some unique properties as well, the um, Rubinia. I don't know if any of you have come across this, but what's this? This is a little UV pen. What's up? Look what happens when I put UV light on it. It fluoresces yellow. Nice. So you can have um, fluorescent candlesticks. But yeah, it's a natural feature of the wood. It's one of the ways you can identify it. What kind of wood you say it is? It's Rubinia, also known as Forsicacia, also known as Black Locust. Okay. All right, I'm going to put the other one on and get the other one to the same stage. Yeah, someone gave me a tree um, three years ago now, I think it was. I'm just going to put the spindle lock on there so I can actually get both hands on the pieces of wood. 
All right, that's good and tight. Piece I'm working on right now is honey locust. It's the same kind of wood. Yep. And black locust and honey locust are surprisingly de different. Yeah, I don't think either are native to the UK, but um, yeah, it's grown as an ornamental tree, really. This came out of somebody's garden. So 1200 RPM again, flatten off the bottom of this one. Same way I did the last one. Yeah, the other cut, as I was saying earlier, you can turn the flute inwards, point the bevel straight across the bottom, you come in and take a small cut from the edge, and then you get the bevel put in the right place, you can run that cut all the way to the middle. So either, either cuts work, it's up to you really which you prefer. The, the, the advantage I think of the of the pull cut is you're doing the cuts into side grain, whereas that push cut you're actually running into end grain twice every revolution, aren't you? So slightly harder cut on the tool. There's still the odd little bit uh, small marks on the edge. So I just need to take another couple of passes off that. Better. What by the way they're so there they are. So I can measure that recess again. Didn't get it right the first time, so I moved the divider and got it on the second attempt. Again, take a bit of wood out shallow cuts with spindle gauge. And then use this to cut the centre. And all the way out to where the dovetail is. Just going to raise that rest slightly. That's just about got it. It's just started to lose its edge. So what I'm going to do is just use a, a flat hone here and you can just run that across the top to take off what was left of the previous bevel and then just hold that on the bevel and put a fresh one on it. And I can feel that fresh bevel on the edge now. So just that quick touch up just to make sure I'll leave the bottom as flat as I can. There's a little fuzzy bit of shave in there so I'm just going to touch the corner of the dovetail just to make sure there's not a fuzzy edge there. So that's all that was for. And then same on the edge, the edge to edge, put the rest across and do my cuts from the right to left. Switch cameras. I've tried to position the overhead camera 
as far as possible so you can see what I see. So, um, not too bad on something like this, but sometimes you're actually sort of working around where the camera is because it gets in the way, but uh, shouldn't be too much of a problem on this one. I think I've got a bit more to go with that. That gauge is just starting to lose its edge. So I'm going to just switch to another one. Save time. And there we go now. Another couple tape. Remember when you're sizing things, whatever you're taking off this side, you're taking the same amount off that side, so it's double that amount you're taking off. So if you only want to take a sixteenth off, your cut's got to be a thirty second. You see what I mean? Right, that's just gone past. And again, if I just bring my gig, I'll get rid of that bit first. Bring the rest in and up to the end. And I can drop the handle. Do that shearing cut again on the edge. Just cleaning out the bottom half of it. Because the top half I'll pretty much turn away. And then that's good for sanding. So we get the rest out of the way. Just hood back in. Slow the load down at the end. So I'm down to about 800. 850 most of this time. Speeds are always a bit of guesswork on a one way, it's just got a dial with numbers on it, so it depends on where the where the knob is get on the actual shaft of the potentiometer as to whether that dial is in the right place or not. So, um, my mind tends to move. If you, if you push it all against it, the stop at one end, it, it, it sort of slips on the shaft slightly. So, uh, to be aware that sometimes it might not be quite as accurate as it should be. Switch back to the side view, probably see more this time. That was 180. And do 240. And 400. Uh, the dust. I'll delay it down even more. I'm turning the extractor off. A little bit of seam on that. This one's just about empty. Should have another one somewhere. Maybe not. What is it you're spraying on there? That was cellulose sanding sealer.
just checking to see if that's not no longer tacky and I think we're just about there. I use steel wool on quite a few of the woods, but all the, I avoid using them on any of the open cord woods because it's um, liable to get caught in the pulls in the wood as it breaks up. Probably wouldn't matter too much on this, but uh, some of the woods like oak and elm and chestnut and things like that, the tannic acid in the sap in the wood will, will react with the um, steel that they leave behind from steel wool so uh, they get little black flecks appearing in the surface sometime after you've made it so with woods like that it's best avoided all right so that's that one done lock the spindle so I can unscrew it so that's both of them done on the screw chuck so I can get rid of the screw chuck now Now referring back to that drawing, the base, it's uh, sort of half a bead on the edge, then a little square section and then sort of an OG towards the centre. Now in the centre of these I need to drill a hole to attach this to the spindle. So it's probably a good idea to do that first. After squaring this off, that is. So I'm just measuring the thickness of this. Just want to see how they compare between the two. That's 59 millimeters, and that one is 38. So they're pretty close, millimeter difference. I'm just going to flatten off this top surface. Doesn't actually matter about flattening the whole of the top surface, but I certainly want the centre two thirds of it. Because that's the bit I'm going to keep. As you can see there, it's just uneven, but I'm pretty much flat on the rest of it, so I think that's close enough. That will do for the moment. So we can move that out of the way. And then to drill these, I've got a one inch force a bit. So that's, that's how I'm going to drill my hole for the spigot for the top half to attach. And how I, how we arrived at an inch I look to my spindles, which I think are about two inch diameter. <clears throat> and I thought, well, I'm going to shape it a bit, put a bead at the bottom. So I want to allow room for all of those things to happen. And um, really on a, well, let's say a less than a 12 inch high candlestick, I'm sure one inch bigger is strong enough. Now then, depth wise, I know I've got well, literally uh, let an eighth, maybe just over, recess in the bottom. And drop the speed down there a bit as well. So I've got at least two thirds of this I can use. So I'll go beyond the depth of the actual edge a little bit more. So we'll go with that. Now the quick way of checking is one of these depth gauge. It's fairly cheap to buy and you can adjust the centre section to where you want. So I can push that in the hole. That's the depth I drilled. I can put this up against the edge. 
put it on this side and you might see it. So you can see there I've gone literally halfway. That's no, like seven eighths of an inch roughly. I can actually go a little bit deeper though than you would there. Right, that'll do. So I'm going to make my spigot probably three quarters of an inch long. Um, so I made my hole deeper than I needed to. Um, it's just over an inch now. So I could actually make it an inch deep and still have a sixteenth at the bottom for the glue. So that's fine. We'll go with that. We'll make it an inch. Right, so that's the hole at the bottom. Now I want to shape the outside of this. Now I'm working with side grain, so I'm effectively supposed to be turning this like a bowl, uh, which means on the side I'm on now, turning from centre out rather, the, the, rather than the other way around. Remember I said in the middle I want to leave space for this other piece of wood to attach. So let's say at the bottom of my spindle I want at least that much. Maybe a little bit more. Let's have a little bit more, maybe that. So I'm just holding my spindle up and thinking how much of this can I get away with. So that's about it. So what was that in actual measurement? So I've got an inch hole and I've got 45, that's an inch and three quarters, isn't it? Roughly. That's my two inches, so yeah. I might stick with the inner one, that's an inch and a half. Yeah, we'll go with an inch and a half, that's fine. Right, so shaping that one, cutting from the bottom, or from the, from the tailstock end back. So, the top half of this, referring to my drawing, it's you've got a bit of a flat and then it comes out into an OG. So I can start forming my OG. Initially I'm just doing the concave part of the curve. And then once I've got more to work with, I'll start going the other way. So I'm just coming out to my line here. And now forming the whole whole curve. And I'm leaving that flat in the middle. And I'm leaving a little bit of a square section for the base of this OG. And I'll cut the OG first. So I'll get rid of more wood on the inside of it. That'll do. And then I can just cut straight in here there's where my square section is going to sit and then once I've defined it I can just trim the curve down a little move the rest over this way and cut the, the half the bead on this outer section. Now really I want probably more depth at the top to get that bead more even. So let's do that. Get a little bit more down there and then I can Sort of use use the wing of the tool a bit a bit like a shear cut there, 
so I can get the, the corner all the way in and then as I bring the tool out I'm just rotating it to, to rotate the flute like that and we do that for an overhead shot as well so I go in on that corner and then the, the left wing starts to cut and as it does I'll pull it back and just rotate the flute so I'd bring the wing around the curve. It's just because I can't get all the way in where I want to, to take that cut in the right direction. So I, I could cut it backwards, I could cut against the grain, but I don't want to do that. I, I think by cutting it the way I did, hopefully I've got a more consistent cut. So I'm just going to deepen that curve more at the top. Get rid of a little bit of that square section. I don't want it quite as big as that. So that's just about it on the outside. I've got the flat where, where I want it at the bottom of the candlestick. So that's going to mate with the base of the candlestick. I've got my OG, got my square, and I've got my um, half a bead there. So again, sand and finish. I think I've got a better cut on this than I did on the bottom actually, so I can probably go straight to 180 on this. So on that flat section and try and keep it properly flat. Work my way round. So when I've got that internal curve, it's, it's an easy way to follow that is put your thumb behind the paper like that and just, just bend it over your thumb to, to get a tight curve. That works pretty well. Lighting on that corner. So I'll work on just one of one of these rather than trying to do both because I think time's going to be against me to try and finish both of them. So um, I'll just do the one from here. So I'll blow the dust off that. I always use a brush to get the dust off rather than trying to blow it. I'm wearing a full face visor here, so if I try and blow it, all I'm going to do is fog my visor up. It doesn't work. Right, if you... Excuse me for 30 seconds, I just need to go and grab another can of that um, sand of the scene. So, just slow the lays down. 
two or three coats of this. It's always better to put two or three light coats on rather than one thick one. So that's exactly what I just tried to do. And I'll give that a minute to dry, speed the lathe up again. Look at the shine on that thing now. Yeah, it soon, soon makes a difference, doesn't it? Yeah. Goodness. Well, I'm taking off some of the sand and zeta, really just to make sure it's smooth. Because you put the sand and zeta on many woods, and it soaks into the wood and air bubbles come out and they set into the surface so it feels slightly rough to the touch you can't see the air bubbles they're too small but i think that's why you get that slight roughness so um just uh sanding that back or cutting it back is definitely worth doing a bit of wax on that i can go up to the edge of the hole but uh I certainly don't want to wax inside the hole. So let's get that one done. And buff that. Get right into that corner again. Right, so that's my bottom piece done. Paul, what kind of wax was that you were using? I was using Renaissance wax. It's a, one of the microcrystalline waxes. It's, um, it's a synthetic wax. I started using it many years ago. I find that um, when I started doing bigger exhibitions, at the end of the day, any of the pieces I hadn't sold all ended up pretty dull and, and flat. Um, so, so I, I mean, the reason that happens is most of the beeswax finishes, the beeswax that's in them, it's got a lower melting point um, than the Renaissance wax and the microcrystalline. So it's that the heat from your hand melts the wax. And that it makes it either soak into the wood or it comes off on your hand. So you're losing the finish. And if a lot of people are handling it during the course of a day, which is exactly what happens at a big exhibition, then you're in trouble. Um, all, your, all your finishes uh, are going to look dull by the end of the day. So that's what I was finding. So, so I switched to Renaissance wax for that reason. And I've used it ever since. And, and it's, it keeps it shine. You can handle it all day and it'll keep it shine. And really, I think the, the reason for that is because it's got a higher melting point. So you, the heat from your hand isn't enough to melt it. Right, so I'm going to mount this piece between centers. And I've got here two ring centers, a match pair, actually. Um, if I bring them here, you can see them on the camera there. Look. So I'm putting a, just a, a solid drive in the headstock and, a, and one with bearings in the they stop. And this piece of wood I prepared earlier, I drew a square on the end, drew on four sides, which makes a little box, and I'll just in, little indentation on each end with an automatic center punch just to locate it on the lay, so I can locate that against the, the center relatively easily. And then that's on the centers. So I'll just apply a bit of pressure. The main reason I'm using the ring centers here is I might well want to take this off to check the fit of the ferrule that's the, of, the, of the spigot. So um, it makes sense to mount it in a way that I can remount it pretty accurately. And these, these ring centers make that ring depression in the end. So that should help me to relocate it should I need to so <clears throat> just for this bit I'll switch to the longer rest again it's speed so um, put the longer rest on there 
few bit of spin just to make sure. Um, this time I'm going to go maximum speed on this range, which is about 1800 RPM. So, start the cut at one end, cut towards the end, so you don't chip the end off. I'm just going to put a little bit more pressure on there. I'm only driving this by friction from that ring centre, so if I put too big a cut on it with the spin the roughing gauge, it's going to stop. The ring centre will spin. It makes it a very useful tool. If you're trying to learn how to use any particular tool and you're getting catches with it, put it between centres with some of these ring centres and just don't put too much pressure on it. And then you'll find that when your tool catches, the wood just stops. So very useful for things like that. So that's taking it down to a cylinder, apart from a little flat up here, I think, yeah, it is. But the rest of it's good down this end. So I think at that point I can switch back to my shorter vest. Now my um, spigot at the bottom is the first thing I want to actually turn. So I need a parting tool and I need to mark, measure the size of my drill that I just used, wherever I put it. There it is. So I've got myself a set of calipers. There's my drill. And I'm just going to wind these in. Let's do it on the overhead camera. There. So I'm winding my calipers in and measuring them against the drill. That's slightly tight, so slacken that. I want it to just just feel resistance when I'm going over it, but very slight. That's it. So I'll square up this bottom and then start to take my first cut. Oh, can you change cameras? Just let me. Uh, Raise his camera up a little. That's better. So I'm going on the end with the parting tool and then I'll put the calipers over it. So that's just down to the right diameter. Now I said earlier, I'm going to make my spigot an inch long. So that's a few cuts. That was an inch and a bit, so I've got my inch there. Probably another two cuts. Yeah, one more. So I can measure it at that end as well. So I'm just trying to feel for the same amount of friction. That's about it. And this bit at the bottom end. Just check it again on here. Right, right, and I'll put a little bevel on the end to make it go in a hole easier. And then at that point, I'll check, we'll measure it. Uh, we'll put it up against the, um, the base. So I can slacken that off, take my piece of wood out, 
and check the fit into there. Now that's perhaps just a little bit tight at the top end, but it's just about gone all the way in. So now I put it in once, I've compressed the fibres on that spigot. So the next time it might just go in slightly easier. But I think I'll just ease that just a little. And also that gives me a good measure for um, setting the base of this up. Where I want the uh, little details to be and the decoration to be. All right, so put that between the centers again. And then that was just a little bit too tight. For doing cuts like this, you want your parting tool to be properly sharp. Because if you want to just take a whisker off, you want to take just what you want with very light pressure, because if your tool's not sharp, you end up pushing it a lot harder than you really needed to, and then you take off more than you wanted to. So I think that's probably it, that's just taking a, a whisker off it. So at the bottom of my candlestick there was a, a square fillet with a, with a cove. So we can, now we've rounded this down, we can actually mark out our detail. I've, I've just turned the lathe down to slow, move some of these measuring implements out of the way, and go back to my drawing. So here's the drawing. And what I'm going to do is put the drawing down here. Hopefully you can see that. I'm trying to get this book to see where it is. There it is. That, that, that'll probably do it. I'll wedge it against the dust extraction hood. It's not quite in focus, but you get the idea. So, so what I've done is, is the base. So this bottom bit here is done. So I want to make the rest of that now. So I've got my little fillet at the bottom. So that's probably that wide. Then I've got a cove, probably about that much, and another little fillet there. And then I've got that long sweeping curve, probably up to there, maybe more. I'm going to start at the bottom work, top of work down now. If we say the top's there, that widest part becomes about there, then it tapers into that point there, and then we've got that um, what to call it, a, a sort of a, a lopsided bead, uh, for want of a better phrase, and then that's where my cove is. So that sort of transposing that onto here, just just doing it by eye. Um, yeah, that, that top bit may be bigger than I want it, but yeah, we'll, we'll go with that. We'll see how we get on. So now, I suppose the next question is, what size are all these things going to be? So that the next thing to do is to size each of these pieces. So this bottom bit, it needs to be about... I said an inch and a half, didn't I? Um, let me find my base. So using the base as the as the measure, it wants to be flat out to that sort of diameter. So that's, that's certainly the widest it needs to be at that point. So I put my hide it on there. That's the bottom bit then. And then the other end of it is considerably smaller. So go into about there. And then the next feature 
will get, take us to about here and at this point that measurement there is very similar to that one there let's just try it with our dividers uh, the calipers here see that measurement there and that one there it's a little bit bigger so if I just gauge it off this one let's do it that size So if you're making multiple spindles, this is the easiest way to do it. You mark out all the features. Now this one, again, is smaller. Down to that, and then we've got those two features so this one here is about the same size as that so if I get my measurement on that this time I'm going to use a narrow parting tool to define that edge now I can't actually get my Dividers in there, my calipers in there. It's a too narrow a gap, so I'm just viewing the two side by side to see if I can get them about the same. So that's that's as much as I need to do with measurements. All the rest you do it by eye, you fill it in by eye. So <coughs> this bottom piece, um, it's one big bead. I'll try and leave the book there. I'm just gonna move this rest a little. So all of this wood is surplus to requirements, so let's get rid of that. And then this is the bottom of my curve, so I'm just gonna get rid of that corner. Get that out of my way basically. So I can just clean up that bottom piece there with a passing cut with a, a gauge. And then I can cut my cove into here. Oop. Bit of a sideways kick there, but we can fix that. So that bit where I got the kick, I just now it now just a tad. Now what I've got to do is make sure I get it right on the second one. So if I, I can mess it up on this one, but can't do that on the second one. Right there. Take that middle section in just a little bit more. This isn't a wood I turn very often, and don't usually come across it to be honest, but um, it is turning very nicely. So I need another feature there, I, I sort of didn't mark out that widest point there. Oop. So I can start. Running a bit slow there, let's turn that speed up.
Okay, that's the bottom part. So this middle bit, that's that's waste wood there. That's going to be our little cove, and then this is going to be a half a bead at the top of that section there. Now this bead, sorry, this cove I've got to do here is a little bit smaller, so it's a bit too small for my half inch gauge, so I'm going to switch to my 3 8 gauge now. And even that's probably just about doable. that one and then this is our rounded over detail that needs to be narrowed down a little first it's smaller than this piece so I've shaved it down a little bit and then we use the bottom two thirds for the right hand curve and the other third will go the other way but what I'm also going to do is just get rid of some of this give myself a bit of space and then at the top here the corner is roughly there where that pencil line is Take that all the way down to the shoulder, so I'm just trying to cut in on the shoulder to get that square and sharp at that edge. And then roll this corner over as the other half of that shape. And then I've just got the top bit to do. Now the bit right at the top is waste wood. Just to make sure I end up with two spindles the same length, I'm cutting a bit off. That'll do. And then I can use my gauge to round over that top part of the curve. So that's more or less it bar the sand in. So we'll take the rest out of the way and get rid of the book now. I think we've covered that. Sign on that thing, it don't look like it needs sanded. Thing is beautiful. So let's get the dust hood back. Top of speed down a little. I'm going to sand in this at 180 grit to start with. If you leave the odd little flat 
I wouldn't worry about it too much because they're very easy to sand out. I mean, you see there on that curve, there's a couple of flats on it, but just one pass with 180 grit and they're all gone. So rather than persevere getting that perfect curve, as long as you've got it close enough, then it doesn't take much to get rid of it. So sand the cove out there. Do that little section there and there. Sand line the curve here. I just want to take that curve farther in from the, that bottom edge. Didn't like the step that was there, and likewise with this side. It's only a small change, but just wasn't quite happy with that. But anyway, here I am now. Now the bit at the top, I need to drill a hole in and put in the, the candle cup. I've got some metal cups. So I need to hold the spindle in a chuck and just do that top part. Let's finish the sanding first. I'm on 320 grit now, just got one more to go. So uh, brush the dust off, slow the lady down, and I'll put some sand and sealing on that.
<laughs> Ready for some wax. Yes, it is, Jim. Well, wow, wax really makes it pop, folks. Sort of. Don't it, though? Look at the shine. Yep. So all that's left to do there is the top. Gorgeous. Are we okay for a few minutes to do that? Absolutely. Yeah. Take, it, take it home, Paul. Take it home. Okay. So what I'm going to do is put my spindle in a chuck now. Uh, where's the smallest set? That's the one. So I've got a small set of the O'Donnell jaws here, and that centre should hold a 25 mil spindle quite nicely, or an inch spindle. If it does a little bit of damage to it, it's not the end of the world because that's going to disappear inside the hole, isn't it? So that's not the end of the world. I need to hold that relatively firmly. Right, so I need to turn away as much as I can there and then draw my candle cup in. So I'm just going to use a conventional cone centre here so I can support the end without restricting access too much. As I turn these bits away, I'm just going to turn my rest around this way. So I'll go into there with my 3.8 spindle gauge. Paul, can you change the camera? Sorry. Let me just try and uh, bring that one down. How's that? That looks good. Uh, that way. So this end was just as, as parted off. So I'm just going to do a couple of cuts across that just to clean up that end grain. And then turn as much of this away as I can before finally cutting it through. So that's the end bit gone. So my candle cups, I measured them earlier, and they are about 15 sixteenths. Um, my nearest <coughs> force in a bit is 7 8 so I'm, so I'm a, a sixteenth out here, but that's as close as I can get. Um, what have I my... Shop, there it is. Now my other problem here is I'm on a short bed lathe. This is a 24, uh, 2416, not a 2436. Uh, have I got enough length of, of the bed? It's going to be touch and go, but I think I'll just about get away with it.
I'm going to have to hang the tailstock off the back to get that in to start with. There you go. Yep. Just. Only just. That's literally my, my tailstock is half off the end of the bed there. Oops. Stop that a minute. So that's not quite in the middle. So you see that slight deflection there. So I'm just going to try and adjust that. That's better. Oh, much better. That was fortunate. Sometimes it takes a bit of a fiddling around, but that was pretty close first right. time. So I dropped the speed of the lathe down on sort of about seven, eight hundred with this. I don't want to go too fast with the forcing the bits. You'll burn the wood. So I'll go into the depth of the cup, the, the saw itself, um, and then a little bit more. Now the cups I've got, they flare out at the end, and I want that flare out to be actually above the surface. So let me just go to. Ooh, Dropped it on the floor, mate. <coughs> Good job the shavings are keeping padding on the floor. <laughs> yeah. So that's the depth I want to go to, just just at the bottom of that flare, and I'll leave that sticking up above the top. So that's about three quarters of an inch at that point. So if I just bring my tailstock out of the way, yeah, I've got a little bit farther to go yet. Yeah. Like that. Another turn on the handle, I think. Okay, you switch the cameras back. We're on, we're there. So let's get the drill out of the way. So as I said, that hole is slightly undersized for this cup. So um, I've just got to open that up a bit. So um, just taking the tailstock off. So I'll put the rest across the end here. And what I'm going to use to do this is one of my box hollowing tools this one here it's a it's a square ended scraper basically but it's not only ground on the end it's ground on the edge so i can actually cut sideways with this as well as forwards so with one or other of those cuts i should be able to get in and uh, just reduce it i'm just rearranging the camera at this end so you can see it better on on this one Up a little bit, there we are. Rest is slightly high. Just try the cup in there. Nearly, just a little bit tight. That's better. 
So that's gone in as far as I want it to, and and the flared bit is, is sticking out of the top. So I've just got to sand this end bit and finish that, and then we're done. Or at least we're right. doing on number one, but uh, I'll do the other one tomorrow, I think. Now the metal cup has got a, they come with screws, so you can screw them in, or, or if you want, you can glue them in, I suppose. Either would work. I'm just going to stop and have a look at that on the end grain. Yeah, that's pretty clean. Yeah, the rest of the tree, some of it I cut into blanks and pieces that I've dried. <coughs> some I've actually rough turned bowls. So I've got a stack of rough turned bowls from this tree um, that I've yet to finish um, and turn. So um, now this one, because I've already sprayed the rest of it, I won't spray that end bit, but I will coat it in cellulose sand and cedar. But I've got this one, the same thing in liquid form, in a bottle, uh, in a jar. So, and I'll keep the, the brush in the jar as well, because it dries really quick, so your, your brush is going to go hard if you let it dry out. So, best thing to do is put a cork in the top of the jar, and then you can just leave the, like that, wine cork, drill a hole in it, stick the brush through it. Good tip. Yep. Good excuse for a bottle of wine. Out, Dave. Absolutely. So you can go and tell your partners that you need to go and get a bottle of wine and drink it all. <laughs> you can share it if you want. A little bit of wax on that. Spotted a blob of sand and cedar on my lathe, so I'll just clean that off. <laughs> All right, so that's the the cup in the top. That's how that goes. It is just about tight enough to stay there on its own, but um, I will put a screw in that to, to make sure it doesn't come out. And that is bottoming out at the bottom of the hole, so that's exactly where I wanted it. And then here's the base. So we can wow. put that on the spindle. Just Tighten that up. When you're, when you're putting the two parts together, think about grain alignment. I've just thrown that in without thinking. And the grain alignment on the spindle is there. The grain alignment on the foot is over here. Yeah. So what I want to do probably is just, just actually it wasn't as far as, as I thought, but so you can see there, we're getting the, the grain pattern there and the grain pattern in the foot the same way and likewise the other side so um but you might need to adjust it slightly to see where you get best fit and i'll, I'll just give it 180 degree turn see if it's better the other way around sometimes it is sometimes it's worse i think that's actually worse so we'll go back to where i was back there so that's grain alignment um i'm just going to switch over here all right can you see that? Yes. It says my yes. bandwidth slow. Why is that? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Absolutely. So, um, so that's it. And yeah, that, that needs gluing in, obviously. I, I'm not, not going to leave it like that. I'll glue that together, but um, um, I'll probably put tight bond on that. And that'll be it. Love it. Put together. And it's a damn nice demo, Paul.
Yeah, very good. Very good. Very good. Yes. Make the other one match the pair, I don't know. So hopefully by the next meeting, I will have finished the other one and I'll show you the pair. <laughs> well, don't sit That's down because here's here it is. The standing ovation is right now. No, don't right. sit down. Yes. It's yes. beautiful, Paul. Absolutely, right. Absolutely, right. Absolutely right. Fantastic. Paul, oh, excellent as always.